You ready? I'm ready. Born ready. So Tyson McGuffin, Ben Johns. Hi, Anna. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Hi, John. Good. So I'm here with Colin Johns. We are together here in New Orleans for the Yola event where they are releasing new Alpha Series paddles. We won't necessarily get into those paddles so much, but but we are of like mind. We both enjoy talking about the technology behind paddles. So. So she's speaking of kind of where power limitations should be capped. Is there a paddle on the market today that you kind of think, okay, this is about as fast as a paddle needs to hit? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think I'm the right person to decide what that should be. Uh, I don't, I don't, it's hard for any one person to decide what it should be. But I think when it's gotten to the point of people are wearing safety glasses predominantly, you've probably hit that point. Right. Um, that's what happened in racquetball a long time ago. Not that I know that much about racquetball, but I know it got very power oriented. People started wearing glasses, uh, and then the game didn't start. Didn't do very well after that. Um, so I think we should learn from the mistakes of other sports, like pickleball always has. And uh, I'd say racquetball made that mistake, and we don't want to do that. So I, I, I think it's very important to expand the limits of power uh, in order to find what the limit should be, what what is appropriate. Right? You're not going to find that until you push the boundaries. Um, so. I think we're we're getting there. I think you know. I agree. I see a lot of amateurs wearing safety glasses on the court yep. just now too. Smart. I think it's very advisable, uh, especially at the amateur level, because yeah, it's for less sure. accurate. For sure, there's <laughs> you know? so much less accurate. It's yeah. like with pros. I, I was literally telling Anna earlier today. I was like, I'm so much more uncomfortable playing against these amateurs right now than any pro. Yeah. Like, I, I don't really care who the pro is. As hard as you hit it, at least you know where you're hitting it. <laughs> right. Do you think there's a paddle out there right now where? It's powerful enough, and it should be capped at that paddle. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you're taking a look, um, you know, I mean, not to not to throw throw shade at any paddle manufacturer out there, but if you're taking a look at that gearbox power, I mm -hmm. think uh, just the way that it comes off, um, how there's not a whole lot of grit on it, and it comes off in a way where it's more of a trampoline effect. Uh, it seems like it, it sails, it really um, springs off the paddle. Yes, it has dwell time, but that dwell time uh, makes it where it more so goes through the court or goes through their opponent versus down. And uh, honestly, I think that's probably the uh, the most poppy paddle that I, uh, I've never experienced that paddle. Obviously, I, I was a Selkirk guy for the last eight years. Um, Selkirk was just a touch behind in the area of, of gaining power. And so when they came out with the 002, I was, a, I was a big fan of that. I personally felt like that was one of the better paddles on the market. Uh, had a nice forgiving hitting zone. Also was plenty poppy. And, um, but I, I feel like from, you know, uh, 2020 to like 2022, that was probably one of the more hotter paddles on the market. Anyhow, so I think uh, looking at the, this year, 2024, uh, if, there, if, there was, if there was one paddle that I would cap as far as power, I would say that that gearbox power, it comes off, comes off in a hurry. And like I was mentioning before, it's more of a trampoline effect where it goes through the court versus, you know, using paddles where it has more carbon fiber and, and it and it gets down and, and it's a little easier to shape, if that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> uh, but honestly, I, I truly think that just with how fast the game is getting right now, if we're going to have it make sense on TV, if if it's gonna um, uh, suit the non-pickleball eye or really just come to life on TV, I don't think power is the answer. I think we either need to cap uh, cap the paddles at a at a at a certain power limit, or simply go to a ball that is much softer. Is there a paddle that you are like? Okay, this one, that's enough. Let's stick with this, guys. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think that it really goes back to what sort of rallies do you want to see? Because if you make a paddle more powerful or less powerful, it's going to change how the game is played simply because of the risk reward of playing a particular style with that sort of paddle. So for example, the paddles are now quite powerful. And as a result of that, it surprises some people that the men's rallies are so long. But the reason for that is that once everyone gets to the kitchen line, everyone is mortally afraid to speed the ball up because if somebody gets a hold of a counter punch with these paddles, the point is just over. So if you wanna see long dink rallies, make the paddles really powerful, that's what we're seeing. Um, but then there's another side effect to where people realize they have a powerful paddle and you can win a lot of points by driving a lot of balls and serving pretty big. Um, you can run some shake and bakes, things like that. So essentially the points are being won and lost either in the first five shots with these big drives and big serves, or once everyone gets to the kitchen line, the dink rallies are really long. Now, 
do we want the game to be played like that or not? I think that's the conversation you have to have. Um, certainly player safety is a component to that. Um, you see more players wearing protective eyewear because of the power of the paddles. Um, but if I had to choose one paddle on the market, and there are a lot out there, so there are probably several examples I could use, but I kind of like where the Onyx 10 millimeters at. So Matt Wright uses that paddle. He also has a 12 millimeter paddle that he plays with. I feel like that paddle is is very hot. It's quite hot, and I'm not trying to materially change how pickleball is played. I don't think we need to go, need to go back to wooden paddles, and I certainly appreciate all the tech that has been introduced. Um, I think the power of that paddle um, is significant, but it's not overwhelming and certainly not dangerous. So the new PPA serve rule, where you kind of drop it at your hip, uh, do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you wish it would stay? Do you wish they would roll it back to the way things were before the rule? I like it. Um, I definitely think tournament by tournament, you know, everybody's hip has risen, uh, including mine, but I feel like everybody's, you know, going a little higher and, and they're not calling it. So I, I think we're going to get back into that. We're already back into that subjective zone. And uh, it's, it's always been subjective. The only thing that truly wouldn't be subjective is a true drop serve, but they clearly don't want to do that. And for aesthetics, I, I understand uh, as long as something is being enforced consistently, I like the drop serve because now no one is, you know, hitting it, you know, so as high, right? Everyone's right. a little lower. And I actually think for me, it's been good because with the lower contact point, you have to accelerate. And I've always struggled with getting kind of tight on my serve and not hitting it. So I've actually been hitting it. I've been hitting it harder uh, this way. So I oh, like really? it. I think it's a step in the so in how- the right direction. I like what they're doing. I just they they need to be calling it consistently. We can't have everybody's hips, you know, reach their nipples. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So when you say you can hit it harder using this new serve, is it, what is it about the, the technique you're using that you can hit it harder? It's just that with the lower contact point, I have to swing faster to okay. make it over the net. Whereas when I had a higher contact point, I could just kind of push it and it's still going to go in. Okay. But it's just, I, I've talked to some other women, I think Andrea Coop and maybe Anna Lee have said the same thing. They're actually hitting it bigger now just because you have to. So mentally it's easier. The new PPA serve rule, where you kind of drop it from your hip. Yes. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Would you rather go back to what the rules were before? Um, so I actually joined the PPA Player Council um, this past year. I replaced my brother on there. Um, so I actually had a hand in writing this rule. And certainly it was not completely up to me. There were a lot of players weighing in on this. Um, but it became somewhat of a hot button topic where some players were really pushing the boundaries of the serve and you, you saw the ref struggling to adjust so part of the intent of writing the rule the way it is now was to make the rule easier for the refs to call so what i like the most about this rule is that the ball starts in a place where it would be legal to serve the ball versus if you use the old way the traditional way to serve you could in theory toss the ball as high as you wanted so the ball is now traveling let's just say from head height and it's dropping 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 down to somewhere that would be legal let's just say waste now up to that point it's in an illegal zone so it's hard for the ref to determine okay did he hit it at chest height or did he let it drop to his waist because it happens very quickly but with this new rule where you have to start the hand basically below most players are uh, tossing the ball palm down um and they're raising their arm up to the top of the hip, that's the new way the rule is written, it goes from a legal zone to a potentially illegal zone. And because you're not allowed to really propel the ball upwards, there's a little bit of natural natural release that is allowed. Um, but I really think it's easier for the refs to call, and no rule is going to be perfect on the serve because you're going to attach it to a body part. Unless you go to a drop serve, there's some gray area. Um, so no rule is perfect, but I do think it is better, and it makes it more universal and easier to enforce across the board. The point is that it makes the referee's job easier to to judge whether or not it's an illegal serve. Yeah, and if you think that you should be able to strike the ball higher, you think the serve should be more of a weapon, that's certainly a different conversation. But I feel like part of the reason people like watching pickleball is that there are rallies. If you look at a sport like tennis, and as a longtime tennis player, I love tennis the way it is. But some people don't like watching tennis because they have a lot of aces and short points. They prefer the longer rallies. You see the court surfaces being slowed down to prevent as many aces as were being hit in tennis many years ago. Um, So I think part of the reason people like pickleball, like watching pickleball, 
is that there are rallies. And the bigger you make the serve, the shorter, the shorter the rallies are going to be. So I would proceed with caution with that. I'm not saying the serve shouldn't be an important shot, and certainly people can occasionally win points with it, but I don't think we need to turn it into too big of a weapon. I hear you. I hear you. Um, do you think it's it's here to stay? I know there's some grumbling when it first started a few tournaments ago, but it seems to have calmed down a bit since then. Yeah, I think it's here to stay, at least for the near term. Certainly we could re-examine it if there are there's a big consensus that we need to go back and re-examine it, but I think most players liked it, liked it, and that's the reason it has stayed. Um, certainly, as representing the players, I try to talk to to many players and get feedback on it, and for the most part, everyone's like, you know what, it was a little awkward in the beginning, and I feel like the refs maybe needed to learn it as well as us, but once they adapted, I kind of like it, and that's what most players are repeating back to me. All right. Um Coffee, Ethiopian or Sumatran? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, Sumatran. What, what do you like about Sumatran? I just don't care for Ethiopian all that much, to be honest. <laughs> More than uh, really liking uh, the, the latter there. I The Ethiopian doesn't appeal to me all that much. Gotcha. I do like the Ethiopian because the, they, they dry it in the berries, and there's a little bit of it. If, you, if you're like a long-term coffee drinker like myself, you can kind of taste the, the berry overtones. You definitely know more about coffee than me because <sighs> I'm the opposite of a coffee snob. I drink coffee every single morning. I'm definitely addicted to coffee, but I'm afraid to get too snobby about it because next thing you know, I'm going to have to grind the beans uh-huh. and get the really expensive <laughs> stuff. I'm good with drinking McDonald's coffee right now and that's fine by me. You're smart. You're <laughs> smart. I did, the, I did the same thing 10 years ago with wine. I was like, I'm not going to become a wine snob because I'm very happy with my $20 bottle of wine. And now I'm kind of inching up. The $50 range is where I'm at right now. So, <laughs> All right. Uh, street tacos or pizza? Pizza. Yeah? I really prefer pizza. Um, I love pizza. My thing with street tacos, I know corn tortillas are more authentic, but I do prefer flour. Okay. So gotcha. most street tacos are going to be corn tortillas <laughs> as well. <laughs> All right, Italian or Indian cuisine? Uh, so I, I do love a lot of Asian cuisine. Um, I wouldn't say Indian is my favorite, but I am probably going to take it over Italian. Right. Um, I, I love some Italian pastas, but the thing is I don't like pasta with red sauce. I only do like white sauce, even though I like love red sauce on pizza. Um, so I love Italian food, but I, I will go with it. All right, bourbon or scotch? You know what? Uh, I am 19 weeks sober, um, but uh, <laughs> you know, back in the day, I was a big IPA guy. Uh, okay. Like my tequila, um, uh-huh. but bourbon or scotch, I would say bourbon. I'm, I'm with you on that. Okay. No. So you, your Scorpius shape, you have the 14 millimeter Scorpius shape, which is a standard shape paddle. It's not elongated. What makes you like both the thinner paddle as well as the the wider, shorter handle? Short, shorter paddle over an elongated mm-hmm. paddle like Ben plays with, for example. Yeah. Um, I didn't think that I was going to like the standard shape, but once I tried it with the Solaire, I just felt like everything about it was better. I felt like I was faster with it. I felt like it had a lower swing weight, uh, you know, less less drag through the air, um, bigger sweet spot, more forgiving. And uh, in my opinion, giving up that extra that quarter inch or I think it's a quarter inch. I kind of felt like if I'm hitting the ball there, I've probably already lost the point anyways, was my kind of philosophy with it. Um, so I just I just preferred it, right? It took me a bit to get used to, but, and then I, I haven't looked back. It's funny, when I first, when I was using an elongated shape, I thought that the more standard shape looked like a frying pan, which a lot of people do say, but now to me that's normal. And I think that elongated paddles all kind of look like thumbs. Um, so it's kind of funny. It's just, it's just like what you're used to. So... I really prefer the standard shape, and I like that, you know, as YOLO's implementation, they still have the elongated handle, which is, of course, important Mm -hmm. to me because I need to have my second hand on the paddle, and I'm not someone who kind of extends the index finger, so I have to be able to wrap it. Um, Yeah, I just just think it's better, personally. I think it's better for most people. I just think the elongated shape is kind of the norm. We're seeing more standard. Mm -hmm. I think people just think they look weirder, but but I I think they're just better uh, for, for most players. My personal opinion, in the 14... I just, it's just kind of like I said earlier, I, I like that power. I've always had really good touch um, in tennis for things like moon balls and th- which I think someone once described the third shot drop to me as a mix between a moon ball and a drop shot and that just really clicked for me. Mm-hmm. And I, those are things I was very good at. So I've always had good hands in that regard. And so the thinner sacrificing a little bit of control is 
it's fine. Totally agree that the standard paddles and even wide body paddles that go out wider than eight inches, I think, are probably better for most people mm -hmm. for various reasons. You know, that given the extra weight laterally, you get a, a bigger twist weight, which enlargens your sweet spot laterally. I think most people hit it off center laterally. And I think you're totally right about the aesthetics of a paddle. Most most people coming into pickleball think the elongated paddles just look better, so they'll mm -hmm. kind of jump into that. I did that, and I shouldn't have because the, the, the wide same, bodies yeah. are are more forgiving, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think in general, you know, that shape of paddle, the Scorpius shape and the wide bodies are probably better for most people and clearly for elite pros like yourself too. <laughs> so so you, your Scorpius is a wide body paddle. It's a standard. Why do you prefer that shape over an elongated shape? So when I first started playing pickleball, I was actually playing with the elongated shape. Um, so when I first started, I was using Ben's old paddles. This is a real throwback. Uh, the Engage Maverick. And from there, I got a sponsorship with Prince, and then I played with the Prince Quantum, which was also elongated. From there, I went to uh, Electrum, and I played with the Model E, also elongated. But when I made the switch to Yola last year, I made the decision to go to a shorter paddle, because at that point, I was playing strictly doubles. And to me, it makes more sense to play with a 16 by 8 paddle for doubles, um, simply because it's more maneuverable and it's more stable. And when a paddle is more stable, you just trust it more. You're going to have more natural power. And in the close hands battles that you have on a pickleball court, the maneuverability really does make a difference where the longer you make a paddle, the harder it is to get around. So especially if somebody fools you with a speed up and you're favoring backhand, getting around to forehand is that much easier with that shorter paddle. Um, also, I hit a lot of defensive shots, certainly block resets. So essentially you have more area to block the ball. Um, so for a defensive player, I think that makes a lot of sense and that would be basically my top reasons on why I finally did make the switch from that elongated shape to more of the traditional maneuverable. What makes you prefer an elongated paddle over a more standard shape or even a wide body like Colin and Anna sure. play with? Yeah, well, I think Colin's paddle is, is great. Um, I've looked at those dimensions before, and honestly, it's, it's almost an optimal doubles paddle for most people. Um, so when I talk to amateurs, if I'm going to recommend them something, I'm like, don't play with my paddle. You play with my brother's paddle. It's easier. Uh, it's definitely easier for defensive shots. You just make more balls, which is really what pickleball is all about. Uh, my paddle is definitely for being more aggressive. Um, there's just, you can get more torque because it's longer. Uh, the sweet spot's higher up because of the handle. Um, so it's, it's good for being aggressive in doubles, and it's certainly somewhat of a singles paddle. Um, if you do play singles, I would definitely recommend it over anything shorter because um, the baseline shots are huge. Even the reach on volleys is, is very helpful at times. Yeah. Yeah, it matches your play style versus Colin's play style when yeah. you play doubles. If you just think about yourself, what kind of player are you, myself or Colin, then that tells you right. what paddle you should be right. using. <laughs> so name one random fact about Ben, your brother, uh, that's not commonly known. Not commonly known. I'll put me on the spot here. Um, I'm trying to go for something that's really uh, that yeah. people really wouldn't know. Dig down in the depths Dig, of your memory. Yeah, Take as much time as you want. Depths of my memory. Okay, this is going to be really random. Ben played one season of soccer when he was really young. I can't remember what age he was, but we were baseball players growing up, and I can't remember if Ben wanted to try soccer or. My dad was like, all right, we'll do something different because my parents are from Northeastern Ohio. So it was football, basketball, baseball, traditional sports. And growing up, those are the ones that we were more funneled towards, um, except for football, because um, my mom said no. But um, soccer, that one season, I remember we showed up and my parents didn't like it. Ben didn't like it all that much. And that was the end of that. And I don't even know if Ben would remember playing that season because he was really <laughs> young. But I'm glad that he didn't stick with soccer. We stuck with the hand-eye coordination sports, and it paid dividends later on. Nice. <laughs> so, so he wasn't a prodigy in soccer. No, no. But at least there's one thing he's not a, amazing at, right? He probably he, would be amazing yeah, at soccer. I don't if know. If he practiced, he'd probably be good at that, too. <laughs> Name one random fact about your brother Colin that's not widely known. Um, okay, well, I, the, the more nerdy people that know stuff about Colin um, probably know this, but I'm going to go with it anyway because a lot of people don't know it, and it's cool. Um, so he did play professional tennis before pickleball, uh, but what most people don't know is he actually played with two forehands. So he didn't have a backhand. He'd hit lefty and righty. And I know you don't see that from him in pickleball. You see a great backhand, but if you see him hit shots from the baseline and how he used to play singles when he did play singles in pickleball, he would hit two forehands instead oh, of a backhand. That's yeah. cool. I didn't know that. Uh, did, he has that 2E, right, in pickleball? In pickleball, as a counter, he does, and as like 
like a, a block he does, but mm -hmm. if you see him hit from the baseline, he'll, he'll hit uh, a lefty foreign, at least in singles. Right, right. Yeah, but not in doubles. All right, so if you had to, to design a new paddle from materials that are not currently on the market, mm. what are some ideas for materials you'd bring to the table? Ooh, this is a fun one. Okay. Um, so the first route I'd probably go uh, that, that I find interesting is more of what table tennis paddles use. Uh, so they're like five to seven um, layers. Um, they usually use some combination of carbon fiber, which we already use, but they often use um, types of light woods, like balsa wood is one of the primary ones. It's a super light, uh, but pretty strong wood. Um, so I'd be interested in layering materials um, using definitely light ones, but very thin layers, thinner than what we use right now. Um, and I think you could get a very quick response from the paddle uh, in terms of, of pop. Primarily not so much on like how we think of, of pop is often like tennis strings where it rebounds and that's what imparts power to the ball. Um, you can actually get good power, especially on volleys from um, something that's super stiff and doesn't keep the ball very long at all. It comes off very quick. So maybe not in terms of velocity, but the ball just comes back almost immediately. Um, and I think that's something that uh, table tennis materials uh, would be able to do. And then there's a number of other ones that they use in combination with, uh, with uh, wood and, and carbon fiber. Um, and then there's even ways to use types of glues. So they, the, like the type of glue that they use with their rubbers uh, in table tennis actually makes a huge difference. Certain ones got banned because they would suspend the rubber in such a way where they just get obscene amounts of spin and, and power. Um, so I think you could because we're not allowed to use rubber, uh, you could certainly use some kind of subtypes of rubber that probably wouldn't technically classify as rubbers uh, in conjunction with uh, those types of glues to um, to do some interesting stuff. So that's where I'd start. So the glues underneath the surface layers. Yeah. Okay. So it's not underneath the surface layers. So like in table tennis, there's the the blade, which has the five to seven layers. Then it's glue, and then it's a rubber, and the rubber is usually composed of two parts. Gotcha. So for so you're talking about bringing in some technology from table tennis, mm -hmm. like the layered cores, yeah. possibly some wood in the core, uh, layered with carbon fiber on top. Any ideas for, for surface layers to the actual texture of the of the paddle? Anything new? Um, We've been using peel ply now. That's been the kind of the king for the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's been definitely types of, a lot of different types of fiber. Um, there's been fiberglass, carbon fiber, um, but there's other types of fiber too that I would definitely experiment with. And then... Um, uh, on the rubber route, I'd have to get very technical with uh, with what they would define as an, a rubber or not, because you could get some stuff that performs like rubber but isn't technically one, uh, and you could probably slip that by. Uh, so that's that's probably where I'd start. Yeah, <laughs> no, I like it, like a smooth faced surface. Correct. So more around stickiness than friction. Yeah, yeah. So like their coefficient of friction with a plastic wiffle ball would be high, but you wouldn't be able to feel this the surface and go, oh, this is going to be a lot of spin. If you were to introduce a new paddle using only materials that are currently not on the market what would you bring to the table in terms of materials to use for whatever the the facing material the grit or the core Ooh, that's a tough question so it, it you can't use it right now and we'd have to introduce it so it'd be something that's not currently on the market Con not currently on the market hmm I feel like the mo the most obvious answer would be something that resembles more of what table tennis has, where they have sponge and rubber, but you'd have to find some way to not make it ridiculous with the spin, because the big difference between table tennis and pickleball is in table tennis, spin is not everything, but it's it's a really, really big part of the game. And in a pickleball, spin is important, but it's not the whole game. Mm -hmm. um, so I think some sort of dumbed down rubber to where you can't spin it ridiculously, but I think that would make the game really interesting, while at the same time, you could sort of counteract the added spin with maybe a little less power. I don't know if you could somehow pad it with the sponge, sort of have the opposite effect of some of these other paddles where you have maximum spin, but not as much power. I think that could mm -hmm. be a very interesting game to watch. All right, if you could change one rule in the USAP equipment guidelines, what would that rule be? If I could change one rule, uh, give me give me a couple rules here. So like they have the stare at machines to test grit, so oh, right, it doesn't right. go over a certain of course, amount right. of grittiness. They have also have the deflection, deflection, yeah. right? So one of those rules. Uh, I, I mean, honestly, if we're if we're looking at safety, I, I think I think the deflection test uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, obviously, touching on our first question, we talked about mm -hmm. you know if there's a, a paddle out there that that we should cap as far as power. What would that be? Um, yeah, I think um, I, I think 
too much grit. Obviously, um, the ball's going to be super shapey. We may see, uh, you know, points prolong a lot more, but I just think uh, that's going to be more entertaining on TV. Uh, I just think the power aspect needs to be capped at a certain rate, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so power would take precedence in terms of limiting that over spin. Correct, correct. Yeah. Spin all day, right? <laughs> Shape that thing all you want, and let's get those RPMs up to up to 4,000. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you could change one rule in the USAP equipment guidelines. Equipment? Yes. Okay. Uh, which would you choose? To change. I, uh, well, the PPA already does it, but I get rid of white paddles. <laughs> white paddles, yeah. Yep. Visibility. V having limited visibility on the ball uh, should not be part of paddles. White, yellow, bright yellow, I assume. Yellow are primarily bright white. <laughs> okay. Any other colors? <laughs> it's, it's usually just anything. Ref they already get rid of reflective stuff, but stuff that is very bright in the sunlight is no good, and stuff that's similar to the color of the ball is no good. So who would win a staring contest, you or James? Oh, I want to say me, but I, I think he might win. Honestly, <laughs> he's just, so, we're both so competitive. I got in many staring contests in elementary school and I was probably the best in, of my kind of cohort of kids, but I feel like he might have just some, he would probably make me laugh. I think he would make me laugh. I think if, <laughs> if we just had to be totally like only like eyes, nothing else, I think uh -huh. I could win, but I think he would make me laugh. So he's a competitor, even for oh, staring contests. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, or Return of the King? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna just, I'm gonna go Fellowship. Yeah. Fellowship. Uh, yeah, I think The Two Towers was a little too long and extended at times. Uh -huh. uh, Return of the King is certainly epic, but I love the uh, the groundwork. Are you talking the movies then? If, do you feel differently about the books? Does he give a? Uh, I was actually book? saying the books. Oh, the books. In, in okay. that case, uh, gotcha. if I was going movies, I'd still say the same for but I think The Two Towers was very well done in, in movies. Yeah, I'd say Two Towers is probably my favorite of the movies, mm -hmm. of the books. I, I, mean, I agree, it'd be between Fellowship and, and The Two Towers. Yeah. Okay, so if you could create a perfect pickleball player by combining two men into one and two women into one, who are the players you would choose and what are their attributes you would choose to put into your Frankenstein player? Two men and two women. Um, okay, for women, I would... Combine Annalise, Annalise like most things <laughs> probably <laughs> with um with probably Georgia Johnson's um, lethality out of the air on the forehand. Uh -oh. Georgia's forehand out of the air is criminal. It's so good, especially when she's hot. Um, so I think if if Al had that. And no one can really have, because Georgia didn't play, uh, she's pretty much a pure pickleball player, almost no tennis. And just, that's why her technique is kind of funky, so slappy, loose mm -hmm. wrist, which, you know, sometimes that's going to be prone to more inconsistency. But when she's hot, she's just destroying men and everything. Mm -hmm. So I think Georgia, especially on the right, is just really terrifying, especially as another girl. Like when you have to be in front of her, I'm so paranoid to make the ball bounce. Another thing that come to, came to mind was Mari Humberg's flick. That thing has been the source of my nightmares recently. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll go with Georgia. I just think her forehand is so unique out of the air. Um, and I combine it pretty much Annalise everything, probably, which might be a bit of a cop-out answer. And then I think for the men, I would combine Ben Johns and James, James Ignatowicz. His, his power, because he does hit a little harder than Ben Ben can hear me say that. That's fine. <laughs> and and uh, the back end is just so lethal. Mm -hmm. James is, you know, Ben is so good out of the air. Ooh, then I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I'll say. You know, also like J.W. Johnson's flick comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Just so good. Maybe the best attack in pickerball. wall. But I think if Ben had James's two-handed backhand, it would probably be over for all of us. If you could create in the lab like a perfect combination of different players, you had to choose... Two, two men to combine into one and mm -hmm. two women to combine into one. Which players would you choose besides, besides yourself? Hmm. Uh, you, can, you can include yourself too. Sure. <laughs> uh, women, I guess I would go Anna Lee and, um, and Anna. Yeah. What, what aspects about their style and play would, would you bring in? Uh, <laughs> a number of them. Um, I guess I'd just take... Anna's kind of combination of transitioning from defense to offense, and I would take Anna Lee's mm, speed ups from from her back end primarily. Um, guys, probably James. 
Um, and since you said myself, I'll take myself as two. Yeah. <laughs> and which which parts of the playstyle? Uh, James, just his uh, his speed ups off the bounce and uh, the grip he uses for his shots it actually functions very well for for hands battles. So probably that as well. Uh, who would you choose for two men to merge into one and two women to mer- merge into one? And why? You know, what aspects of their game would you kind of choose, right? So the Annalee Waters double-handed backhand or, or whatever. Mm, that's an interesting question. I like that. So the most obvious first part of that, you'd have to pick Ben and Annalee separately for the men and the women. It's just a question of, all right, who do you add to complement them? And on the men's side, I'm going to say Ben and James Ignatowicz um, because I think Ben, in my unbiased opinion, has the most complete game. Um, he attacks the best overall, um, but he has great variety in his attacks. Um, and then he plays sneaky good defense. His thirds are very good. Um, good serve, good return. Like He's a very complete player. Um, the one thing that James has that Ben does not have is the two-handed backhand. So James's best shot, in my opinion, is that stretching two-handed backhand counter, and that's one Ben has definitely worked on and gotten better at. Um, but James hits it just so hard and so accurately. I feel like if you combined James's game in some ways with Ben's game, um, the James Ignatovich overhead definitely has a little bit more on it than Ben's overhead. So that would be an awfully dangerous player. Um, and they definitely both attack very well. So I think that player would be pretty awesome. On the women's side, Annalie Waters, obvious choice. Um, her backhand is just so pure, so good. Um, you want to pair her attacking skills with somebody who's really good on defense. So I would pair her with Catherine Parento. I think that if I were teaching somebody how to play, I would tell them to watch Catherine's strokes because they're just, they're beautiful. They flow nicely. They're very consistent. They're very replicatable. And her defense is, in my opinion, the best on the women's side. So you pair her defense with Annalise defense. And Annalise defense is, is not bad by any stretch, but I think Catherine's is at that top level, um, I think that player is basically it. You, you'll probably be happy to know that I asked Ben and Colin the same question, and their men's mix-up was both Ben and James. That's very funny, yeah. <laughs> yeah what were their women's, the what were their women's matchups? Ben chose you, you and Annalie. Oh. The two Annas. Well, our games are very similar, <laughs> but uh, I'll take that. I just kind of consider myself a, a little bit of a, of a budget version. Uh, not saying that that's how I'll always be, but I, I just our games are very similar. Sure, uh, But that's... Yeah. That's very kind of him. Well, that's all I have for you. Thanks so much, Anna. Awesome. I thank appreciate you. the time. All right, Colin. Well, thank you so much. It was, yes. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Yes, and, thanks uh, for having me. All right, Ben. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. Awesome, Tyson. Well, thank you so much yeah, for thank joining you, John. me. Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate and, you, uh, brother. Yeah.